Hi, welcome to the second of three round tables organized for, uh, for the initiative known everyone. as Everyone Proposals for Novel Ways of Being. My name is Lucas and I work in the Curator Programs team of National Gallery Singapore. The speakers we have today are some of the program partners of the Novel Ways Initiative, and we will be hoping to get their thoughts on the impact of the pandemic on uh, what they do, and also on what arts and culture can, has been doing, and will want to do in response. Before I introduce uh, the speakers, allow me to say a little bit about the initiative. Proposals for Novel Ways of Being is an initiative co-developed by National Gallery Singapore and Singapore Art Museum who are joined by 10 other local art institutions, art spaces, and artist collectives to create a series of exhibitions and programs specifically in response to the impact of the COVID-19 pandemic on Singapore and its art ecosystem. By creating platforms for curatorial and artistic projects, which run from August of this year to February 2021, Novel Ways aims to work in solidarity to rally or otherwise concentrate the efforts of the Singapore art community so that all our audiences would have something to look forward to as we exit Circuit Breaker and its various stages. The key aim for the initiative is to be able to provide some support for artists and other cultural workers in terms of remuneration for participation, space to work, as well as other organizational and less tangible support. And of last count, the initiative involves more than 170 cultural workers, not counting the multiplier trickle down effect when we work with video editors, photographers, uh, art movers, programmers, all involved in the various uh, novel ways projects. And further, institutions like Gallery, SAM and SCPI were asked to go a little bit further and to engage external curators to work on their projects rather than look in-house. The title, Proposals for Novel Ways of Being, makes a deliberate reference to the name of the virus causing COVID-19. For us, it is a reminder that this is, in a sense, just a new virus and a new crisis. There will be other viruses and other crises. It is thus a way to recognize that uh, the turmoil caused by this pandemic is both unprecedented and not. And perhaps there are lessons to be drawn from the past and of course, lessons to be drawn from this crisis for the future. Importantly, the initiative demonstrates a belief in the essentialness of art and artists and their role in reflecting the conditions and anxieties of our time, as well as to imagine and propose ways to rethink our relationship to the structures of the world order, be these economic or sociopolitical, uh, what have you, and to nature and to one another. So please go to novelwaysofbeing.sg to find out more about the projects by the 12 program partners. And uh, there you will also find information and recordings of programs organized in conjunction like this round table. So uh, I now invite our speakers to turn on their cameras and microphones. We have with us today, uh, Karen Un, Deputy Director of Curator Programs at the NTU Center for Contemporary Art Singapore. Hi, Karen. Hello. We have Rita Tagui, Director of SCPI Gallery. Hey, Rita. Hi. We have Russell Storer, Director of Curatorial and Research at National Gallery Singapore. Hello. Hi, Russell. Hi. And uh, representing Softball Stats, we have Luca Lam, Queen, and Johan Yasmin. Hi. Hey. Hey. Thanks, everyone, for making the time today for this roundtable. Um, I guess we'll start it proper, uh, just to, for our audience to know that this is not a show and tell where everybody presents their PowerPoint presentations. Rather, I will just pose a few questions to our speakers and uh, uh, largely about their respective novel ways projects and take it from there. There's some time uh, for questions and answers, so do send in your questions in the, in the Q&A section. So, dear speakers, uh, reminded that you're encouraged to ask questions of one another, interrupt uh, if you have to, politely, of course. And uh, So, to get us started, I will ask this as a general question to everyone. Uh, anybody can feel free to pick up on it. It is that um, when museums, art spaces and fairs started to close or be cancelled as a result of COVID-19, everything suddenly went online, you know, uh, like this program. And... I would posit and uh, think that the original artwork or being in the presence of art uh, of an installation would become therefore even more important and precious for visitors. 
do you agree with this? And uh, more importantly, perhaps, do you think artists agree with this? Or are we already seeing artists start to rethink their practice or the presentation of their artworks as we adapt it for this new normal? Uh, feel free to respond by sharing uh, how the pandemic has, has kind of changed or influenced the way you run your programs, your exhibitions and projects, or any of your professional plans. Can I go first? <laughs> yes, sure. Thanks, Rita. Okay, so um, to answer your first question, absolutely. I think the, the idea of the physical and of um, human connections have become even more precious and valued this year, right? Because the physical presence of art is really an, an experience that we cannot replace by digital translations. Um, I think it can be complemented, uh, it can be supported by them, but not fully replaced. Mm -hmm. uh, which is why um, for the next edition of Sea Focus in January um, next year, STPI is really aiming to present both a physical curated platform on site, as well as to offer a strong programming online to complement the, and to, to include the larger Sea Focus uh, community. I think the, the way forward really is definitely the acceleration of the digital. It's definitely here to stay. Um, not just for the visual arts sector, but for many business segments. Um, mm. And the adoption of you know, certain digital technologies will definitely become the, the new normal, the new ingredient in, in the way we continue. Um, mm. I've had many conversations with um, our artists, artists who have been within the STPI roster and those uh, um, outside this. And I can say that um, artistic practices or the process of creating art has changed to the extent where the artists have had the chance and the time to really be a, a lot more reflective and inward looking because a lot of art fairs are cancelled, uh, exhibitions have been postponed, you know, and suddenly mm -hmm. there is this luxury of time to just be more self-reflexive, um, to pause from the travels and to focus a lot more on their practices. And I don't think artists uh, would shift their practices to sort of suit online presentations better, you know, if this is like the new normal where technology plays a, a, a big role. Um, right. You try and make their art a bit more Instagrammable. I, I don't think um, it, it, is, it has been the case. I think actually it's been the reverse. It's been an op opportunity for them to reflect on what is authentic and what is important in their art making. Mm. Thank you. Yeah, mm -hmm. but I, I guess I was more thinking in terms of also artists who maybe are a little more comfortable with uh, technology or the digital aspects of things, right? So it's not so much about uh, adapting works for the online platform, but to kind of rethink their practice a little bit even and where, where technology is part of it or the digital is part of it. Yeah. I mean, I think that's the biggest thing to note is that I think people have been trying to really understand, you know, what's like a translation, you know, Rita mentioned there are certain things that feel mm. like they're a digital translation of an offline experience or of an analog experience. And then what's just a really sort of natural use of technology that is something that's been in our lives, mm. um, you know, since, um, you know, for, for all of us, you know, speaking here, I think this is, you know, the idea of media and, and art being sort of intertwined is is not a new thing. Um, but honestly, I think it's um, often you know institutions are sort of slower to to take up <laughs> technology, um, you know, rather than than artists or other creative practitioners. Um, you know, I'm from the states where you know there are endless management consultants approached for you know various kinds of institutional, uh, you know, either you know reformations or sort of transformations. And, you know, mm. even, you know, five or 10 years ago, I remember this was like a constant question is, is your kid's technology more advanced than your museums or your institutions? And pretty much across the board, the answer is always yes, because I think, you know, and in an institutional context, it's, you know, always like, you know, a, a thing that wants to be sort of perfected before it's presented, whether it's, you know, a online or offline digital 
tool. And so, I mean, from my point of view, um, not just from being here at NTUCCA, but I think just seeing sort of in the art world at large, it's been really interesting to see institutions be willing to, you know, show things that are not 100% perfected and, you know, being willing to have conversations that do seem less scripted um, to, you know, incorporating technology in a way that is more similar to the way we live with it. Um, and I think that barrier coming down, the, the idea of having like the perfected presentation versus real life, um, those lines being blurred is actually quite interesting. And, um, and I think is, you know, one of the, the better things that we've been able to do, you know, at, at NTCCA in terms of, you know, our programming and things that have gone online is that we've tried to be sort of open to things you know, being experimental and sort of being as they are. It's great that you say that because I, I often I often wonder working in the National Gallery, uh, how we like to have the perfect uh, exhibition just mm. like pops up, you know, when the hoarding comes down, everything's in place. But actually, um, do we necessarily need to do that when, you know, I think our businesses really care about what goes on behind the scenes. You know, they want to know our process uh, and they're curious about that. Do um, any okay. other speakers have thoughts on this? Or maybe, um, you know, part of your yeah. practice already uh, reveals a lot of your, your, your kind of inner workings. I mean, Sorry, I'll just Russell. quickly follow on from what you said, Lucas, obviously from National Gallery. I mean, yeah, yeah we're a much bigger beast uh, than NTU CCA or STPI, so a much slower ship to turn around. Um, and, you know, while we've been trying to respond quickly, obviously it's, it t it's taken a lot longer than maybe we initially thought. And, and as you say, the desire to be perfect and the desire to you know, have a certain level of quality, which of course we want to achieve, is actually not as easy as just flipping the switch. So it's been a very rapid kind of learning, I think. And across the board, I mean, we do have certain departments that are much more digitally savvy, but others who are not. And we've had to really <laughs> kind of take that on in, in a very, very <laughs> rapid way. I mean, it's really pushed that forward. But it, it, it has opened up a lot of really exciting possibilities as well. But I think it does take some time to, to really work out what is the best way to do that. And, um, mm. Yeah, I think it certainly loosened us up a bit as well, I think. I think there's more opportunities to, to be a bit more responsive. Mm. So I guess because the whole stuff is an artist run initiative and collaborative project with actually quite a lot of members, there is a nimbleness there. And we're, we've always been a bit of a scrappy operation. This is probably the biggest budget we've ever worked with, but it's still dispersed among many projects. Um, and we have a lot of projects, I think, because that are tailor made to sort of implicate both online and offline worlds because of the interests of our artists. And maybe Johan and Huying can elaborate a bit more about their own investments here to give a clearer idea of what we're talking about. Yes, please. Yeah. Um, Huying, you want to go ahead first? <laughs> um, yeah, we have this dynamic. <laughs> but um, yeah, I was thinking about Lucas's point about what it means for art to be you know, does it, if it goes online, does the experience change? And also, you know, this idea of the luxury of time. Mm. There's sometimes this perception that artists spend a lot of time just thinking about their art. And at least for the people in softball starts, I think, and I guess also members of our, like people in the circle, um, a lot of time goes into everyday life as well. And it's not a simple thing of saying that, yes, now we actually have more time to just create art and think about the practice because there are ongoing changes. The same things that uh, people who, are, who don't see themselves as practicing art face in daily life are faced by artists as well. And mm -hmm. for myself, I still kind of am on this strange space between seeing myself as a, more of a researcher than an artist, but I do mm -hmm. work with art and art making. And I think one of the really important things, like coming from a background in geography, when you think about what it means to encounter and see art in its form, is that the notion of space is still really important, like physical space, digital space, they're all different spaces. Mm -hmm. But if we take the physical out of that encounter, you lose the visceral aspect, the mm -hmm. notion of 
personal personhood in a specific moment in time. Um, the notion of tactility as well, and also social encounter, which is also part of certain kinds of art. And these are things that I feel, at least within the 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 interests of the members in softball stats, are really important, like tactility, mm -hmm. um, kind of dialogue, responsiveness, uh, connection. Mm -hmm. um, Dissent, dissension as well. So the consensus and dissension, the, all these things are really part of what it make, means to be in the process of art making mm. or um, as an art worker or cultural worker. And I feel uh, these things don't change just because suddenly, you know, you have a pandemic and you have to go online, but it does change the tone and the, the approach that, and also even the sense of like how we can connect one another, whether we can come into the same space and although we have continued discussions online, I think there's been a strong push also to try to find ways to still meet in physical space, despite mm. the changing rhythms of lockdown. Yeah. So we could probably talk a bit more about that later, but uh, yeah, Johan yeah. has some points. Yeah, I guess for me, my perspective is quite specific, I think, and to myself as well, because my practice is like as an art worker and as an artist has always been kind of skewed towards the digital and like to kind of internet-based practices as well. Um, like, yeah, like I, I usually engage with things like websites or electronic literature or like video games. Um, so these kinds of like that shift towards the digital was not in terms of practice was not as dramatic, I, I would say for myself, but I know that's like a very specific, like a very specific kind of perspective and there are questions of like digital access as well um, that we've seen like crop up throughout the circuit breaker as well, where people were like requiring laptops for instance, or like for like schooling or working from home. So the, the idea that all of us kind of just can recline at home with our laptops and start working in that manner is a very specific context as well. Um, so yeah, even though, assumptions made. Yeah. yeah, definitely. So even though my practice is very much engaged with the internet and that transition, like if I could call it a transition at all, is not so much a huge shift per se. Um, I'm quite aware that it's a very specific kind of position to take as well. Um, and a lot of our projects kind of take place both online and off in various leaky ways. Like and this is all already before uh, COVID-19. Um, times? Yeah. Sometimes. Yeah, I, I think we've always kind of used the online presence very much as a way of extending like our tentacles in some shape or form. Mm -hmm. um, but definitely in this moment, like it almost feels like a necessity. And right. like in my individual practice, I think it's always kind of existed online as well. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You're really lucky in that sense because the, the shift and the movement for us was pretty dramatic because STPI gallery is very used to traveling for the major art fairs mm -hmm. throughout the calendar year. And then we are, you know, working constantly with artists in our workshop for residencies, right? That's the core of what we do. So it was really a remarkable, <laughs> it was frightening actually, to be honest, when it first happened and everything came to a standstill and, you know, how quickly we had to think on our feet and just modify and adapt everything that we were doing, right? So I think the two major shifts for us were really calibrating and going digital, as I mentioned before. Mm. Uh, we presented our first online exhibition in April, you know, to us it was like amazing because we're so Johnny come lately on the digital, right? <laughs> we were like, wow, <laughs> we did an exhibition online, how amazing is that? Um, and then, you know, we, we continued to engage with our audiences uh, with some, you know, online digital initiatives. So mm. I think this is the momentum, the, the way that it's, uh, it's going to, you know, continue moving forward. But I think the second major shift for us uh, was also the, the, the fact that everything is going local now. So whilst the ongoing residencies uh, with internationally based artists are continuing, uh, you know, via Zoom, emails, uh, discussions. Yeah. The new focus at the moment is really 
looking at local artists and um, getting them in for our artist residency project, you know. Um, mm -hmm. There's exhibitions also we've organized uh, very uh, strong uh, local artist uh, exhibitions. We've just uh, closed one with, you know, our cultural medallion winners, uh, those who have done their residencies at STPI. Um, yeah, so I think the, 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 it's in a way it's wonderful to be able to sort of move away from all the distractions of the past and to be really more aware of your immediate uh, surroundings, aware of your, you know, your next door gallery, the artists that are closer to home. Yeah. yeah. To, to, I guess, appreciate what more with what was already here. But um, I, I think what uh, uh, is coming up and also what Huing mentioned earlier, like the loss of that viscerality uh, of, of, of working uh, um, on site, you know, or seeing arts on site actually comes through in a lot of the projects that uh, we see in, in novel ways. I mean, just the, the ones uh, from the, uh, our roundtable uh, participants here, you know, for example, uh, uh, Under the Skin by, uh, by CCA, already uh, references what uh, asks the questions of what it means to uh, do performance work when you can't physically have people view them. Um, I thought, I, I don't know whether maybe Karen would want to say a little bit about your novel waste project. Sure, thanks. I mean, yeah. I think, you know, the, the idea of trying to work with performance that would still feel, with, feel like performance yet be accessible as an online video was, um, you know, very much at the core of the project. So, you know, we were very happy to uh, work with Chong Ka Kit, an artist uh, who has also uh, worked in a curatorial capacity and was also formerly a research manager at NTUCCA. Mm. Um, and I think we were particularly interested in, you know, what, um, what the sort of, not just what the end product would look like, but what the sort of entire process of creation would look like and how, you know, there are aspects of, you know, performance um, in a live sense that we wanted to, to you know, have as a, a present element in, in the videos themselves. Um, and I think that's part of why he uh, very early on identified uh, the cinematographer and filmmaker Russell Morton um, as someone who would be a sort of close collaborator with each of the artists so that it wasn't necessarily like the, you know, production of the artist to create a video, but rather they were creating the performance that was then sort of, you know, the, the job of the, you know, filmmaker cinematographer to sort of uh, turn into the, the final product of the video. So I think from, you know, NTCCA's standpoint, it very much, you know, has to do with the idea of research, um, which, you know, as a sort of national research center, um, you know, the, the creation of new work Mm. It's important, but also kind of like what does the sort of, you know, process of creation and the, you know, research both that goes into the works and the kind of site specificity, but also into, you know, the process of having, you know, three sort of unrelated projects by three artists who, you know, had not worked together and were not collaborating in any way. Uh, what does that mean to have sort of a connecting tissue between, you know, the cinematographer and the curator and the institution and kind of, you know, what's the sort of interesting outcome um, from that point of view. And so that's why I think we've really enjoyed being part of the sort of proposals for novel ways of being family, because it feels like we're also very connected to these other projects that are, you know, you know, wildly different in terms of their presentation and the content um, and, and also the process, but that the idea that we're all sort of connected through the conditions under which these projects were realized and the sort of time that we're all living through the kind of unseen forces at work, um, including mm. financial ones, which, you know, I think that, you know, that's an interesting thing that you brought up um, at the beginning, Lucas, is that, you know, one of the key goals for the project is, you know, that there would be remuneration for uh, the individual 
creative practitioners and that, you know, this would sort of um, create, you know, the conditions for commissioning work in an environment when overall things were being canceled or delayed or otherwise sort of pushed down the road. Um, mm -hmm. But then also sort of understanding that there are these really difficult financial circumstances that are affecting institutions, that are affecting yeah. individuals, and that that's kind of the, the background. So while it's not necessarily that every piece is sort of like a somber reflection on our, you know, stark economic reality, but just that that is something that we're actually all going through together. And there's something that's actually sort of, you know, more interesting to see how we can deal with it. Um, maybe not necessarily together, but kind of at the same time. Yeah. Well, I, I think there's solidarity in, in uh, experiencing this at the mm -hmm. same time, you know? Yeah. yeah I mean, I'll, I'll, the, the way in which we all uh, experience the impact of the pandemic might be different, but I think there are still some commonalities, some shared aspects. And, Lucas, uh, sorry, yeah. go ahead. Oh, no, I was actually going to say that because uh, uh, um, um, Karen was talking about how you know, to, uh, to see all these like, various uh, programs by the other program partners in novel ways roll out. And I was already going to ask for more stats to talk because your uh, participation has a number of projects. I think nine projects that uh, kind of unfurl over from August onwards. Do you want to say a little bit uh, about how uh, you're kind of spacing that out and you know, just tell us a little bit about what you're doing and what's coming up next? Mm. So we, we organize it according to the various interests of our members and some of the projects are collaborative. So it's within members and sites of our studs, but also extended outside to other persons who may be suitable for our project. Mm -hmm. um, Johan's project, for example, involves Sean Chua, also from Software Sets, but other artists like Chong Li, Denise Yap. Um, and really, I think as far as Software Sets tends to operate, we tend to operate in these like in bursts of intensive time. And it's often also quite malleable. Mm -hmm. And they're just, we, I mean, similar, I think in the initial planning stage with such a big budget, Similar to other organizations, we did the boring organizational work of like parsing things out, like delegation. Um, but we were also, I think, sensitive to like, we could make changes as and when we need it. Like durations for the gardening project mm. would sort of disperse and weed and weave as and when things happened. Mm. Um, Johan and Huyin, do you have more to add? Actually, I wanted to ask a financial question, but let's finish this first. Um, yeah. I, so like following Lucas' point, I think I'm just reflecting about this and like listening to what Rita was saying as well as Karen. I think this thing about, you know, with, with the, the lockdowns and the pandemic rolling in, um, how institutions respond and the idea that it's a bit scary because it's so much that's changing. And I'm just imagining what it's like as an institution. Um, I think softball starts functions a bit differently. We have more fluidity because we are smaller, but we are also kind of, we know each other as friends. Um, and we have worked before in this kind of like, kind of, we've been kind of trying to refine what it means to work as a network for a while, mm -hmm. or as a collective or as a group. Oh, I think one thing that Novel Ways really brought was some impetus to bring together some ideas that had already been brewing. Uh, it's not that these ideas were all new. Many of these were things that we had been considering or there was some interest, but it never really congealed into something. Mm -hmm. So there was a lot of planning at the early stage about what kind of ideas, how we would allocate and split the funds, how we would space things out, how we would try to have some things happen online and offline. Um, because already at that point, we knew that it would last quite some time. Um, so for instance, one of the, the projects that I was most involved in, um, the garden project, mm. probably got the level of interest from members of Stats because, and, and friends as well, partly because we were all under lockdown. And there was a lot of interest at that point about 
growing food yourself because yep. there was that fear of like you know food shortages there was a questioning of what it means like in a pandemic what does it mean about ecological change yeah and i think the garden project was interesting partly because it was very place based you needed to build it but then we were thinking how it would be possible for other people to tune into it and understand the process so we have the, the same problems of um, the visceral part the you know having to be there in person but then how do you show this work to other people because it is a work as well so i'm mm -hmm. thinking along what probably what Rita might be thinking about and i guess part of the challenges made us try to document the process i mean documentation was one of the things that members marcus myself uh, a few others have been quite interested in like how to show a process and so we documented the process of how we got the garden going and Marcus put it together. Marcus and Johan worked together to put it into a, a Google Doc that you can see on the website. So that okay. in some ways, even if you can't see the garden, you understand the decisions we made, the thoughts that we had, why we decided to make it a weedy garden rather than a well-spruced garden. Right. Um, yeah. So those are just some thoughts um, on my side. And audiences can click on the link in the chat to go directly to uh, Beyond Repair, South Wales Starts Project. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, so I, I think maybe adding on to that, um, so this kind of tangle of like the nine kind of projects um, that consists of like the different nodes of individuals who are members of South Wales Studs, um, it was kind of taken from this text by Stephen J. Jackson, uh, who comes from a science and technology studies kind of background, but looking specifically at the idea of repair as a kind of improvisational and generative practice instead of this clinical kind of process of following a manual, but something that is sensitive to the changes um, within a system or a structure and what are the kinds of practices that can emerge from that. Um, so it, it's this twofold thing, right, of having to contend with a world that's always falling apart and mm. coming up with practices that engage with that in a sensitive and considered manner. So I guess each of us have kind of like our own different ways of trying to process this, whether it's like um, Kenneth and Wayson organizing Monsoon School with like a different set of practitioners with all different ideas of how they would want to do like an on online presentation of their practices um, or like the current project that I'm working on now and is like gonna launch on Saturday. Um, which is called Viscous Fairy Grottoes Arcades Project, um, which is an alternate reality game that takes place both online and off at the, like online on Software Stats website and also at the space itself. Um, so kind of taking off from how video gaming was kind of a tool for community building, but also as a mode of comfort under pandemic time. Mm -hmm. So yeah, I guess these are just the different kinds of emergent practices or like, ways of us like kind of constructing um, means of engaging with what it means to be in this contemporary moment. Yeah. Thank you. Because I guess we became also extremely aware that when you have a certain idea of crisis or emergency time, mm. um, certain rhetorics and infrastructures get a boost, harden or become like seem almost as inevitable horizons. And you kind of want to look across scales and be valued across geographical borders, social borders, mm -hmm. um, what actually that means and to question that inevitability. And also, I guess in Singapore, a place that's so technocratically sophisticated in terms of handling the pandemic, mm -hmm. certain forms of like tackling crisis become almost like, oh, of course, that is the best kind of solution necessarily. And a lot of these narratives and forms of engagement gain so much traction, um, not, you know, not forgetting that Singapore itself and its manner of um, its mode of technocratic governance, um, especially in Asia, mm. has so much traction. Mm. Just seeing the way like Serbana Jurong um, plans cities in Asia it becomes like that horizon, you know? And I think that yeah. it's, it's always necessary to question that. Yeah. Uh, yeah. yeah. No, um, I, I completely agree. And I think this is also part of uh, why, I guess, the initiative is named as it is, like 
we, we didn't say that we have novel ways of being, we have proposals for novel ways of being. The idea is that we don't, we're, we're not necessarily thinking that art or the or partners can provide solutions. You know, there are, uh, there were experts in, in anything. It's just to let art and artists kind of show the way for, to ask certain questions, to um, highlight certain things that can help us kind of think together uh, and imagine kind of uh, a, a better way out. Yeah. So um, I, I think this is great because Johan was talking about like things being like broken. And uh, this is of course linked to what uh, Tian from Substation was talking about in the first round table uh, that happened last month. And, uh, and I know that uh, in kind of the synopsis for South Wall Stats Novel Waste Project, you know, you, we, you speak about uh, arts imbrication within structures of harm, exhaustion, extraction, and precarity. So I wanted to ask all our uh, speakers, uh, what do you think uh, the role art and culture can play uh, and it should play in addressing maybe uh, all these kind of structural issues or, or so, uh, issues of social inequalities or structural inequity. So this um, isn't limited to Singapore, so you can feel free to respond uh, at any level or context. Yeah, I'll just uh, quickly pick up in relation to the project that we're showing at National Gallery, which is the exercise of meaning in a glitch season that Shahida Iskandar has curated as a guest curator for us. And I think, I mean, the premise of the exhibition was to really look at these very questions, you know, how um, social inequality, how various forms of representation have come forward or been pushed back, um, and that's been made much more visible or invisible due to this current situation. Um, so I think that's a really important way to really provide this space. And I think the, the, the exhibition has this kind of thread, I think, of this idea of the glitch, but there's space between creating a space or you know, um, to really question, you know, uh, some of these issues that really come forward. And mm -hmm. working with a community of artists, I mean, it, I mean, Shahida, organize the show in record time, I think three months, <laughs> which is unprecedented for us. And, you know, it was um, very interesting for us as an institution to work in a very different way, a much more improvised way, um, but to really offer a space for younger artists and, and a younger curator to really present their ideas um, within, this, you know, this, within this context. And um, I think it's opened up a really important space for the gallery. Um, to have these conversations. And I think there'll be iterations from this um, you know, much further down. Thank you. And here, this uh, speakers, uh, the question was, uh, it's quite difficult, I know, uh, what uh, role art and culture might be able to play uh, in addressing issues of social inequalities and such. I was, I was thinking about uh, Russell's about the glitch, introducing the glitch. And yeah, I think art and culture in many cities, there's one, one, one plane of it that is this like uninterrupted smooth plane of perfection, or at least like the resemblance of perfection. And then there's another plane that we consider, some people call, call it the underground, the informal. But it's actually where the real life of art and culture is, where you have many more different layers that are constantly in play, mm -hmm. in exchange, and where, where the real interest of like, you know, why, what draws people to the arts if it's not for capital, not for money, that's where things really are. And mm -hmm. that's where a lot of discussions about <clears throat> things that are really close to people's hearts really sit. And I think that's one of the most important parts of <clears throat> art and culture in a glitch season where so many, especially right now at this time, I think more than in, I mean, you can't compare this to World Wars, but definitely in the generation that still is alive now, there's many more meanings that are at stake, many ethics, ethical questions to be unraveled and thought through together. There's uh, increasing nationalism across the world, there's increasing sense of uncertainty, things like, you know, basic food needs, supply chains, all these things create fear. And 
if the arts and culture is not also able to hold space for the kind of feelings that are rising at this time, you know, what else can it do? Or rather, I, perhaps that is one of the most important things it can do. Mm. Um, in terms of like the temporality of industry and how we've been shifting across centuries, I guess the arts and culture, is, arts has always seen, been witness to different forms of the psyche or different ways of thinking. And maybe this is one of the things that we can do now, that we can hold space for uh, the shutdown, planetary shutdown in some ways, but also understanding what that means, what, what it means to mourn, what it means to be with other people and non-people, non-humans. It's really sad. Can you respond? But, I mean, yeah, but I mean, coming back to the idea of social inequality, yeah. We tend to compartmentalize social inequality from ecological inequality. And things are quite connected in many ways. And that's yeah. one of the things that I think policy alone can't try to understand. You know, why is it that some people's behaviors won't shift in some ways? Or also, why should some behaviors shift in some ways? It's not something you can technocratically impose. That's one of the things that we could feel through, I suppose. Right. I guess I'm also thinking of this through like the multivalency of the art worker's practice or that being an artist isn't necessarily just about producing art objects. Um, and oftentimes it expands out into just working with the communities or the networks that are pre-existing that you already have ties to. Um, whether it's like mutual aid projects, for instance, um, that kind of or like these very simple kind of spreadsheets that are set up online that try to fulfill the needs and wants of people who are like structurally much more precarious, um, especially during like a uh, lockdown period. Um, so these, these kinds of initiatives might not be legible, for instance, as an art object or an art project, but these are also things that art workers are taking on and organizing and doing. So I think to think beyond of artists as producers of art objects is really important as well. And to think about what it means to be a cultural worker, what it means to organize or exist within a community. Yeah. So actually, I want to maybe bring up again my financial question. Um, we are very glad to have received such an amazing budget from both NGS and Sam. Uh, and we're also wondering whether these projects have cause for other structural evaluations within institutional organizations in terms of how you pay artists, in terms of how you engage with artists or engage with harm in institutions or with artists who might have produced harm. Um, seeing that we, not all of us, of course, there is a bank of time, perhaps for institutional stakeholders to reevaluate these things. Has that come up so far? Uh, absolutely. I mean, I think, I mean, it's a conversation that has really, I guess, been accelerated by the current situation. And I mean, this Novel Ways has been one, I guess, avenue for those discussions to take place, but certainly in a broader sense and thinking about the wider implications for institutions in terms of inequality, in terms of representation, in terms of, yeah, um, you know, fair treatment, and support of the art community. So I think it's a big question and there's some structural change that needs to take place, um, which does take time, but it's absolutely um, brought that forward. And I think um, on a number of fronts, we've had to really reassess how we work. And I think it's maybe of interest to our audiences, whoever they may be, to realize that ecologies of art in Singapore. There are silos, but it's also incredibly interconnected. Like Southwest that has friends who work at the National Gallery, for instance, and we might be perceived as a more scrappy outfit. But I think we also need to realize that in an ecosystem like Singapore, our, re our relation to, let's say, institutions might be different. And this might not just be the case in Singapore. I think we have to be a bit more realistic and less sometimes romantic about like the way artistic worlds operate. Um, but these relays are also what keeps information and conversation 
and rebuttals moving. Yeah. Mm. Yeah, I mean, I think this has been a really important initiative in terms of making connections, having conversations, um, and really bringing forward the kinds of different structures that we work within, but also are connected by. And I think, um, you know, this is, I guess, a new situation. I mean, we've done some collaborations with local institutions, but not in this sense. Mm -hmm. So yeah. I, I really hope that this can really continue in different yeah. ways. Yeah. That you know, with the relations that we uh, relationships that we form at this point, you know, we might work more together, or and realize, uh, you know, where there are more points of intersection, that this when productive conflicts can happen. We can we mm -hmm. can disagree, and mm -hmm. work through certain things. Yeah. Well, um, since uh, Russell, I, uh, I guess, uh, related to what uh, Luca was asking, I wanted to ask uh, what it was like to have Shahida as the gallery's first guest curator. Mm. Like, and and I, I think a lot of people would have asked her, uh, Shahida, what it was like to be, to be working at a national gallery. But I'm actually rather more interested in asking how the gallery has uh, changed or, or had to adapt to working with somebody external, somebody, somebody young and has uh, mm. you know, clearly a very like, fresh perspective on the, the, the way yeah. things should work. Yeah, I mean, we were lucky that Shahida is, you know, a fantastic person to work with. I mean, very professional, very ethical, um, communicates very clearly. Um, and as I said, it was, was organised in very quick time, for, which for any project is very challenging, not to mention mm -hmm. having to work within a split team structure where only half the staff can be around at any one time. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, I mean, we, we had to adapt really fast in terms of, and, and the other thing is most of the artists have never shown at the gallery before either. So we're dealing with a whole new group of artists, a, a curator working within this big institutional structure with very quite rigid processes and maybe could seem a little opaque to someone who hasn't worked with a museum before. So, mm -hmm. I mean, one thing we realised is that these these processes can't be assumed. I mean, we get so used to working in this way, but it doesn't necessarily make sense to everyone. Yeah, um, yeah. And these really- expecting people to bend to yeah, our, so our way of working. Yeah, so these really need to be articulated much more clearly from the outset. And that's something we learned quite quickly. We had to, um, and that, you know, that there needs to be certain flexibilities as well, of course, um, in terms of working, um, mm. which, you know, and thankfully, you know, the, Shahida and the artists were very patient and understanding and, and you know we worked very closely with with them as well to try and you know just find the way forward I mean I think in the end it came together you know really really well and very, you know, if we may say so ourselves. if we may say so I mean I'm very very happy with how it came together but of course it wasn't without its hiccups um, and, and a lot of it's down to communication and, and just understanding where each other is coming from because we work in such different ways and, and that does need to be, you know, that just needs to be shared and explained and discussed. Okay, thank you. Well, speaking of the guest curators, before we open up to the floor for uh, Q&A, I wanted to ask Rita uh, whether you could tell us a little bit about what it was like working with uh, Guo Liang for your Novel Waste project and tell us about your project. Okay, um, so I guess collaborating is not uh, something new to STPIs always been in within our DNA to collaborate with um, so many different parties. But I think this time around was slightly, this, there was a slight nostalgia, I think, to it. The idea of that, you know, solidarity, recognizing our common human predicament, the period of difficulty. So in, in that sense, it was slightly um, different for me, at least. Um, I was very grateful for, for the experience of working with Golian because he made it just so seamless and easy and, you know, we, we got off the right track. We understood exactly, well, I understood exactly where he was coming from. Um, he had a very clear idea of what he wanted to present um, using ab abstraction really as the main uh, method for us to consider facets of our existence. So mm -hmm. facets of the natural, the emotional, technological um, and temporal, which he equates to nature. Um, and the whole exhibition um, is an exercise of slow looking, you know, mm. uh, it's very anti like, you know, going in, whipping around and 10 minutes is done. It is really bringing about the quality of empathy 
and um, the idea of transience in, in, in the human experience. Um, if I can read something from him, because I'm just like... Oh, sure. <laughs> in, in, because we produce a, a book for this exhibition, um, and he says uh, central to this idea, to, to this exhibition is the idea of liveliness as, as observed in many forms in nature, technology, our interior life and our affective time. Um, it is an exercise in close looking and attempt to read abstraction in relation to the idiosyncrasies and particularities in each of the artist's works. And in doing so, we might on one hand begin to think about how to befriend a strange space of abstraction, and on the other, consider how it could offer us proposals for living with different forms of being. So that's like the thrust of this exhibition, which I hope all of you will come and <laughs> visit at some point. <laughs> Let's do that. Thank you for reading that. <laughs> Maybe now's a good time to see what questions we have. Uh, to all those who are, who are watching, uh, send in your questions in the QA in the Q and A function, please. Don't hold back. Um, a question for Rita. Uh, I'm gonna read it out loud. Uh, SCPI is known for being one of the biggest commercial players in Singapore in terms of its international standing. Uh, engagement with leading international artists, presence at international art fairs, etc. So with the turn to focusing on local artists, which uh, of course is fantastic and necessary, how do you strike a balance between engaging with a local art scene while kind of avoiding uh, nationalist thinking or, you know, or parochialism? It's quite an important one for all of us to, to think about, actually. Oh, Rita, you're, you're, you're muted. Yeah, sorry. As I mentioned earlier, the current projects with um, um, artists, with our artist residencies are still running. So we are very much in, um, in touch with uh, internationally based artists. We're still gearing towards the idea of, you know, um, completing this body of works from the residencies and ultimately presenting these in our exhibition space. Um, online, we are still very active in all the major international art fairs, which you might have known by now is, has all gone online. So uh, uh, the, the three art Basel fairs, Hong Kong, Basel and Miami Beach have gone online. Recently, Freeze as well, um, as well as all, yeah, all the Freeze fairs have gone online. So mm. we have still very much been uh, present in all these fairs and you know in, in that sense we are still um, connecting with um, our collectors the collectors that we would normally be engaged with uh, yeah. on site yeah we still maintain that sort of uh, relationship in, in that sense so it's not going to be entirely you know oh, let's all only do local now there will definitely have to be a balance between the two yeah mm -hmm. I'd also be curious as to the sites that Mala is encountering, encountering local art for the sense of it to be about nationalism necessarily um, and whether that is one form of like a temperature of how locality might still be perceived even though there are so many like complex tiers involved. Right, yeah. It's like a Singapore artist might not necessarily be doing uh, Singapore work. No, not at all. Sense. I mean, like, yeah. and then, even if you're doing something about Singapore, that doesn't make it nationalistic. Yep. Yep. Nice distinction. Would any uh, of other speakers like to respond? Yes, we. Yeah, I'd like to jump in with this. Um, it's always interesting how when you bring up the local, you also bring in this other keyword, the global. And sometimes when you see things in terms of local and global only, you fix yourself into this mind or mindset that uh, stops you from seeing other things. And the issue is that in Singapore, the idea of the global and local is really strong. And so we are often tied between two poles where we want to go between you know, local authors and international authors, and we have to like do both at the same time. But 
every local art scene has a whole mix of worlds in them. And often people in any space right next to you are thinking about what it means to be something like across a broad range of things to be someone from a different world, a different country, to be talking to someone from a different place, to be thinking about issues that are very important to you that you read about from somewhere else. So I don't think you can say that the local is not also international or global. Um, and in fact, these two terms stop us from thinking about other kinds of things, um, including how local artists local artists are thinking through something that goes beyond nationalism or maybe something that's trying to move beyond the idea of the nation state. Mm -hmm. But I mean, I'm really curious how, I mean, I'm curious where this question comes from. But I'm also curious how institutions respond to this question of nationalism. Yeah. And like well, balancing. Well, whether our institutions would like to respond and we can also ask Malar S if she wants to reply in the Q&A section. Russell or Karen? I mean, I think, I mean, one of the things we've really tried to do at the gallery, particularly with, say, the Singapore Gallery um, and the Southeast Asia Galleries is to try and break down some of these nationalist frameworks. Um, I mean, the Southeast Asia Gallery isn't based on a national structure. It's a regional one. And looking at commonalities and differences across the region um, and connections through historical forces like colonialism, the movement of people, um, different influences or transactions that take place. Um, and in the Singapore gallery as well, I think there's, there's the attempt to look at different narratives or counter narratives, not necessarily just the linear kind of story that's maybe been told for a long time. So I think it's, I mean, as a national gallery, obviously we have this, you know, we do have to present a national story in a sense, but we've tried to make it as complex and, and sort of multifaceted as possible. And the fact that it is changing all the time, you know, we bring in new research, we, um, we um, you know, we're rethinking the collection galleries all the time. And um, obviously through programming as well, there's ways to intersect and get different perspectives and viewpoints. Yeah, I mean, I think at, you know, NTUCCA, you know, a place that was originally founded with a very sort of overtly international sort of purview and program. It's um, been interesting that, you know, it was, you know, actually the, the brainchild partly of the Economic Development Board and the idea that there was kind of a international or cosmopolitan aspect that needed to be, uh, to, that needed to have, you know, a home, um, a gallery home in Singapore. And this was, you know, in the dark ages, this was many years ago, like seven or eight years ago. Um, and then sort of thinking about how all of these discussions have, you know, sort of continued to evolve, that spaces have continued to evolve. And um, if anything, you know, our founding director, Utamata Bauer, when she actually joined after CCA was originally envisioned and founded was to, you know, actively incorporate sort of Singapore and, you know, particularly in our residency program, having Singaporean artists play a significant role, sort of, you know, saying that, you know, the, this sort of dichotomy between the international and the local um, serves no one and actually, you know, creates a much less interesting sort of environment uh, for research. Um, so it's interesting that we're now at this position now, um, you know, on the eve of, you know, in, early 2021 by April 2021, CCA will transform very significantly away from having a permanent exhibition space. Um, and, you know, I think the sort of reorientation towards things like publications, um, as well as our residencies, um, various kinds of educational programs, and then also really thinking about, you know, what does a curatorial body do or what can we offer without a permanent space, um, it's very much connected to this question of, you know, what is the right balance of, you know, creating sort of a, a locality, sort of a location that has a very, you know, specific um, rootedness um, and the idea that, you know, these, these issues that we're dealing with, whether it's from a local perspective or not, are sort of by nature quite international and quite, um, 
very much the stuff of kind of humanity um, rather than sort of being tied to any particular sort of political reality or material reality. And so, um, you know, if anything, I think it's actually been a really interesting moment for us that our sort of institutional transformation has coincided with the pandemic and with, you know, a lot of very overt sort of rethinking of what institutions can and should be doing and what the sort of balance is between online and offline, this, you know, kind of relationship between, um, you know, the sort of migration of ideas and the sort of limitations on mobility or the ability to cross borders at the moment. Um, so, uh, you know, again, I think this is part of why it's been particularly helpful to feel like we're part of this kind of multi-institutional uh, approach to thinking about what, what might some of the proposals for, for ways to move forward, what might those look like or sound like or feel like. And, um, you know, again, this is, you know, in the context of understanding that there is a lot of contracting going mm -hmm. on and, yeah. you know, not just for our institution. I mean, individual projects have all had their budgets um, shrunk. I mean, I think this is not a surprise or a secret that, you know, the, the sort of institutional pivots, um, it's not just for fun. It's not just to see what we can do better. It's really to see how we can survive and how we can sort of um, come up with sort of new ways of continuing to serve the public. Um, and so this, I think, kind of also gets to your question about, you know, how can art institutions also sort of address or deal with social inequality? And I think a lot of it um, is very much in the idea that there is, there is a need to preserve kinds of spaces, um, whether they are physical or sort of virtual or even conceptual, um, mm. where these issues will continue to be addressed and yeah. that it's not sort of an unfortunate circumstance where like, you know, economic times are different. Yeah. And so then institutions change or, or in some cases go yeah. away. Yeah. Um, and then, you know, it's like the, the conversations and the convenings also stop. I think it's a question of how do we really figure out the best way to continue these yeah. these types of meetings and these types of platforms. Yeah, that, that, that's linked to what uh, came up earlier, because at the beginning, um, I think somebody referred to software starts as being nimble. And later on, uh, Luca said that they were malleable. And I think that's quite different because malleable suggests that they're used to this kind of being buffeted by challenges and by the need to adapt already. You know, and maybe this is something that the bigger institutions like us are, are learning to do now uh, to be more malleable. In, in these times, we, um, I think actually we had an, a question I'm just gonna, uh, that has already been answered, uh, but I, I thought I would just read it out loud so that we have this officially on recording. Um, somebody anonymous asked, uh, hello, softball stats, interested to find out about your ways of working. So do you work together to coordinate these varied projects or do you, your individual members just run with their interests and they love your website. So Luca has replied by, uh, Luca, are you okay to kind of verbalize it for us? Yeah, no. I'll rehash it and Johan and Huang should definitely jump in at any point yeah. in time. Um, Yo Johan did a website, by the way, yeah. Mint. Um, <laughs> so, I mean, honestly, like for people who are not familiar with software stats, it really began with like four artists as just a studio space. And over time, it began to gather momentum and room and persons. And I think the interest was more like sometimes we support one person's interests. Um, so we aid in like setting up tech, you know, or like just like helping email people. Or sometimes it's very much like there's a lot of resonance between a few parties. Um, like the garden in question is a project between Huying, Johan, myself, Marcus, and a couple others. Mm. Um, and so we sort of work as this, the group now is pretty big, okay, it's like a Korean boy band. Um, but we work in these like small like melee teams almost, you know, like a video game campaign, um, all doing so sort of different things. And I guess I think it's something to clarify also is in as much as that we are a scrappy operation, uh, I think we've also acknowledged that we have a lot of processing power. Mm. Um, and a very extensive network, actually. Um, and these are things that we managed to do on our own. And I just like to encourage younger artists or artists like generation really that you don't always have to depend on institutions to do it. You, in fact, should 
just really invest in your interests and find new ways of doing things. And it's not always easy and there isn't always capital and not everyone can do it. Um, and that's the reality of the situation. When I say not everyone can do it, I mean that there are financial restraints and I think that needs to be ameliorated. Um, but back to like the question again, yeah, we tend to work in that, that format. Um, and sometimes conversation is, what is a nine to five day? I, we don't know it. And it's possible yeah. that institutions, I don't think any of these institutions also know what a nine to five day is to be very honest. Not anymore. Um, so the flows of working, it's in that way. Yeah. Thank you. Well, um, if, uh, I, I guess I would ask and by asking whether any of our speakers have questions for one another. If not, uh, I guess uh, we can, it's, it's, it's time. So I think we can wrap for the day. So uh, thank you very much to our speakers, Karen, Rita, Russell, Luca, Huying, and Johan. Thank you. thank you very much for being here today for the roundtable. And uh, a big thank you also to our audiences joining us from home uh, on the go. Uh, so for more information on now, the exhibitions and programs uh, that our speakers have been talking about and been working on, please go to novelwaysofbeing.sg. And uh, in, in closing, please do take 30 seconds to leave your feedback on today's programs by scanning the QR code that will be appearing on screen after this. We would love to hear from you. Thank you very much, everyone. Bye. Thank, Thank you. you. See you, everyone. Thanks. Bye. <laughs>